Almighty Father in heaven, in the name of your Son, our glorious and victorious Savior, Jesus Christ, we humbly ask for your blessing upon our worship of you on this, your holy and sanctified Sabbath day, so that we may grow more in our knowledge of you, our love for you, and our obedience to you. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he saith true, that ye might believe. For these things were done, that the scripture should be fulfilled, a bone of him shall not be broken. And again another scripture saith, they shall look on him whom they pierced. Amen. And we are back again, obviously, uh, recording sermons, writing studies uh, after another break. As you know, we, we were off for the summer uh, trying to prevent things that cause breaks. Uh, but it came down to a matter of time as I learned the hard way uh, in the first week of September. I explained all this on actually on the website, um, and those explanations are still there, so I'm not going to repeat it all here. Um, but it was something a matter of time. And people, I think, don't realize just how much work is involved in producing something like this. And I, I, this is the only answer I can give to those who are, are skeptical of that, is go and write a daily Bible study for yourself. You don't have to do anything just with it. Just write it. And you'll, you'll find probably the first one will take you a while, two or three days, whatever. But you'll get better at it. You, you probably will. Most people will, with a little practice. And you'll get to the point where you get it done in a day. All, everything. I'm not just talking about the the writing. I'm talking about the research. You have to be able to... If you're writing about the Bible, you should know what the Bible says, right? That's the whole point of it. And then all the technical matters and all the other things that involved are involved, uh, you'll find that you could probably get it all done in a day. And that's good. And at the end of the day, you'll feel, well, I worked hard and I did well. And, here we and so you go to bed that night, you get up the next morning, and... Every day is a new day. It's like today doesn't care what you did yesterday. You're going to have to do it again today. And you're going to have to do it again tomorrow. And every day from now on, as long as it's on. And that's the point that people don't seem to get very well until they actually try to do it. And that's the reason I would suggest doing it. Uh, when we came back in September, I found myself facing a 48-hour day. And QA Publishing was up and running. Again, the, the point about many people have asked about that. Why is why is a ministry labeled or entitled published by Keyway Publishing? Why don't you have a church on it? Well, church was never intended. How about that for an answer? You know, I, I began Keyway Publishing 20 years ago, almost at exactly the same time I started writing Daily Bible Study, which was my daily Bible study. There was no big plan. It was just a matter of, that was actually at that time. I think it was on a DOS computer it was before Windows. You know, back when the dinosaurs ruled the earth, as the old joke goes. And it was on folders back then. Were called directories. And I forget exactly how I did it. It might even have been an abbreviation. I would have to go and check my note. I don't even have those computers anymore because they're sold. They won't even run anymore. I don't think I could. I remember how to log into a DOS computer now. Anyway, but it was a matter of. It was simply my daily Bible study. I think that was the name of it. And when it, the Internet came along, uh, I had a means of the Internet provider that I had at that time provided free web space. I think it was like a megabyte or something. Wow. And it was like, who could have it? And so I, just as a matter of security, because it was all electronic, it wasn't something I could print out or I, I could, but if you happen to be around at that time, you remember the kind of printers that they had back then, the old dot matrix things, which were very loud, and they had the rolls of paper, and, and they were slow, and it was it was just a nasty business printing any amount of material. And so I didn't, and everything was electronic, and I thought, well, I, if my house ever burns down and all that, my study notes will be on their server, because I knew they did backups, and they stored them off-site, because I asked them, I remember that specifically. So I put it on there, and, and there we were, or there I was, because that's all it was at the time. And I, I got an email from someone one day explaining why well, they, they mentioned how they were reading my study, and they, they liked it and all that, and I thought, well, wait a minute, what are you doing reading my stuff? 
because to me daily Bible study was a pri it's just somewhere where I stored my notes. It's like somebody reading your diary or something. And I, I must admit I wasn't happy about it. Again, the, the the motive of the beginning all of this. It was about studying the Bible, period. And but then I thought and I thought, well, okay, you want to read it, go ahead. You know, I mean there's nothing wrong with it. There's nothing there to hide. If you want to read it, go ahead. And then I realized that other people were reading it for the same reason, because of the search engines. Things like something called Google was just beginning that. And there were other search engines before that time that were doing that. So I thought, well, go ahead. You want to read it? Read it. Fine. And it grew on from there. But Keyway Publishing was a regular company. It was intended to be an online company. And in that regard, even though Daily Bible Study took over all of its time, so it never got around to doing that, it was one of the earliest online companies because it was fully intended to be that way. Key way. And he was talking about a keyboard. But the thing is, Daily Bible Study began taking more and more and more and more at the time until it had it all. So Kiwi Publishing was still there, but Daily Bible Study just sort of hijacked it, took it over. It was on Kiwi Publishing servers, as it still is to this day. And when someone makes a donation to Daily Bible Study, they do so to Keyway Publishing, and that's the reason. But this summer I thought, well, I'm going to try to get Keyway Publishing going, and that would solve problems that we've been having with, with popularity. But one thing I've discovered, people can absolutely hate your guts, but they'll still read your stuff. They may pray to have you. One lady a while back prayed that she said she was praying the good Christian lady. She said, she was praying that I would fall down the stairs somewhere and be paralyzed. Another suggested I should go blind. These are good Christian people. That just shows you. And again, prophecy, you know, it's there. But it was a matter of, I was hoping to get Kiwi Publishing going and then all of that sort of thing. I would just, daily Bible study would be there. Same as on, it was for a security measure. And that worked. I, over the summer, I got a lot of work done on Kiwi Publishing. It was ready to go as it still is this moment. You know, I could step over there. And over there, is, there's another desk where I'm recording this. There's actually two desks. It's like I'm living two lives, but I've only got time for one of them. You ever done that? And that's what happened. And, and the first September I come back, turned on Daily Bible Study, and it was like it just took over again, all the time again. And we were running a rather large deficit over the past couple of years because to compound it all, I've become, as some may have noticed, I've become a little more direct in how I preach the gospel. I don't care what you think. I only care about the truth. There's only one opinion that I care about, and that's the Lord God. When he returns, what he thinks about it. And because I know his, the Father's opinion will be the same thing when he comes. If I can get the first one right, you get the second one right. But it's it, that's the only opinion. And if, if I ruffled some feathers, as I know I do, I don't do it deliberately, but I do do it, and I do know it. And people get a little bit angry with that, so they... And even within the true church of God, as I've found, uh, they're actually some of the worst there in that sense as a matter of being offended because they tend to be conservative, quote-unquote, keeping in mind that in, in this world, cons I, I mean, as well, I was as well, I'm not, I'm not knocking it. It would be great if conservative truly was conservative, but in this case, in this world, it's mostly about right-wing politics and right or left-wing I'll put the link on for that study, is, is relative anyway. But, it, you know, if you want to back up, you're looking for a national leader who's a Sunday keeper and he does Christmas and Easter and, and he believes in go to, going to heaven. And uh, What exactly are, are you looking for as a leader? You know, and all the other politics of it. And, of course, the liberal-minded people, they've got their problems with perversions of every sort. Although the conservatives are rapidly catching up if they want to get reelected and all the rest of that. But the world is the world and we're to come out of it, not become a part of it and wallow in it and support it. You know, come out of her, my people. Come out of that Babylon. It doesn't matter if you're left Bab Babylon or right Babylon. It makes no difference. Babylon's Babylon. And so it offended a lot of people and people stopped supporting the ministry and then we were running a deficit and then some debt. I got a humongous debt personally that I ran up because of that. Um, and after we shut it off again in this month, we recovered a little bit, 
but now that we're back on it's just so slowly going right back to where it was again so the problem is coming again uh, I just have to find another solution one that's going to last and so actually uh, as far as being done daily Bible study the written studies I think are done as far as as having covered literally everything we have I mean the hardest part of writing a study now is finding something I haven't covered at least two or three times before uh, the only the only thing that was left hanging if I would have retired from daily Bible study in the past month would, was these sermons that was the one loose end and it's the reason too I want to uh, begin I was going to say begin right away today but I think we need to cover this but also I want to start doing something in a way that we were doing weren't doing before we were doing chapters by chapter but keeping in mind there were no chapters in the scriptures as they were originally written there weren't any verses either the verses and chapters were, were actually about 200 years apart they were pr produced by interjected by or invented by printers primarily so you know it's not being unbiblical by ignoring them because they're unbiblical anyway and as we get done uh, John now uh, if not today I don't think it'll be today because it's four chapters four the amount of material remaining I don't think we'll get finished today particularly because I'm using a little bit of time now but we probably will by next week and then we have remaining then the epistles of the Bible of which act as an epistle a letter written to Theophilus. Revelation is an epistle written by Jesus Christ to the seven churches. And of course the epistle epistles. And we've actually already covered one, uh, the epistle which was known as Luke. Luke and, and Acts were written by the same man, Luke, uh, obviously, to the same man, Theophilus. It was a personal letter. You talk about people reading your stuff. You know, Millions of people have, have read Theophilus' letters uh, from Luke which are known today as the Gospel Book of Luke and the Book of Acts. You know, those are letters. So he could say, what are you doing reading my stuff to? I guess there's a point there. But rather than ending in thereafter, starting at chapter, verse 1s of chapters, we will simply go and stop where we do. Whatever verse numbers. I'll try to keep it within a particular incident when something is going on, because actually that is really the way it was recorded. And sometimes the people want to read chapters. They won't, don't want to just take a verse. And, and it's a good idea in that, you know, you, you want to read things in context. So they read the entire chapter. But the chapters weren't there in the original scriptures. The verses weren't either. You, you have to look at the lesson. And sometimes in for the length of a sermon or a length of a particular lesson that the Messiah gave, that it, carried, it can carry over for two or three chapters. Or there can be two or three in a chapter. But it's it's not something that reading the, the chapter alone will get you the whole picture. John 3.16 is a, is a glaring example of that. Not only is that verse taken out of context, but the whole lesson that he was speaking of began in the so-called chapter before it. And, you know, you, you see John 3.16 all over the place. Maybe one person in a million uh, really understands what it's talking about. The born again and when that's going to happen and all the rest of it. Nobody's born again yet. I suppose that makes more people mad, but so what? Truth is the truth is the truth. As I said, the only opinion I really care about, don't get me wrong when I say that, but the one that really matters is that of Jesus Christ, and that applies as much to you as to anyone else. It applies to everyone. He's our judge. So we're back at it again. I really want to get this, this Bible reading done. Uh, I can't guarantee anything as far as being here from week to week because that's really not in my hands. Uh, if I could find a way again, uh, I'm going to see if we can do something with that in some way that, that is different than what we had in the summer. It's, it was a great idea. It really was. I, and, you know, I wish it had worked. But maybe there was a reason it didn't in that because I would not have been doing this as much as then. But we, it gives us a humongous problem. In that if you can't, if something that does not pay the bills consumes all of your time, what's going to happen to you? Think about it. And that's what happened. And Keyway Publishing would have taken care of all of that, but it wouldn't have left any time for daily Bible study. It would have 
carried Daily Bible Study, paid for it all, Kiwi Publishing would have, but there wouldn't have been any time for Daily Bible Study to actually produce it. So you see the conundrum that we were in, and still are. It's it's not solved. Uh, we're out of the woods a little bit. Uh, we've had a, some help from some true Christians, rare, blessed people who put their support uh, where their mouth is, and that's good because they are actually the reason we're back on. Very few people are from around the world, actually, that have done that, but very few. And without them, we wouldn't be here now. And, you know, it isn't fair that they would have to carry the load themselves either. Uh, as I said many times, if, if one in a hundred people who use daily Bible study were, con- were to contribute a quarter, 25 cents a month, one in a hundred were to do that, we wouldn't have any problems. See, it doesn't take a great sacrifice. No one will do that, of course. And there are those who believe in tithing. Well, you know, that's that's been so abused, including within the Church of God, people within uh, the Armstrong tradition, uh, to the point where they actually think that Church of God meant them, that organization, when in fact Church of God actually was around a lot before. It's a biblical term, not a man-made one or corporate one or any of that. But, you know, there's been a lot of abuse, and we, we're the ones that have to, we as in those who have come later, uh, are the ones that have to put up with it, suffer the consequences for it, or the abuse of what others did. And, you know, being cynical about it, I don't blame them. I, I'm rather cynical about it myself because of the behavior that I've seen, the antics uh, within the true church of God. Some really good people, but I think there's some wolves in there too. People, there's a lot of, Johns and Peters and good people, and but there's a lot of people that John encountered in his his epistles as well. You know, the diatrophies are true or two. Uh, the church, you know, without getting or going on all that, but the thing is, we have to live in the real world such as it is, and there we are. And this, hopefully, you know, we're going to be here. But again, I can't do it alone unless we find a solution. Uh, to be to my being able to run daily Bible study and Kiwi publishing at the same time, there is not enough time. That's our problem. That's it. You want a, one sentence? There's not enough time to do both. And if I could find a way to do both effectively, I mean, sure, I could do both, but not very well. You know, you can do it's the old saying. You know, you can do one thing well, you can do a number of things poorly, and that's true. But I, I would be happy just to have them both functioning, you know, to begin with, just to have them both alive. But Keyway Publishing has been really taken over by Daily Bible Study, to the point where Keyway Publishing was, it never, never developed into what it was created to be because Daily Bible Study took over its time. This is not new. I mean, it's been like that for 20 years. They, they've existed together as entities, as registered entities, together, almost from the same day, from the same month anyway. But the thing is, daily Bible study took all the time. And that I don't I'm not complaining about that. I think that's wonderful. But the thing is, we have to be I can't go to the company uh that houses our servers and say to them, Well it's all free. It's the internet, so it's all free. Everything's free. Uh so I don't have to pay you this month for our servers and all the internet uh, service that we use is sitting on their, their, the trunk, a trunk line, uh, a backbone which is connected into the major other, uh, thing. It's not all wireless because there has to be, the wires have to be connected to something. But what would they say to me if I said that to them? You know, get out of here. Take your server with you. They, they pull the plug out of it. And that's the reality. But the thing is we need to be able to function in this world. In order to do that, we have to do what we have to do. And that's the point that I was trying to make. I know I don't want to stretch it on out, but a lot of people still don't get it. Uh, They still don't understand that, you know, just because it's the Internet, it's not free. It isn't. And I know in this world, such as it is, that's, that's the attitude now. But the thing is, you're seeing a lot of things disappear. I mean, newspapers, look at the hit they've taken. Uh, Paper newspapers, you know, they're dying. And even online, they, they thought that they, they could move online, just move it all online. 
and you know instead of the paper it seemed like a great idea look at all the save the trees things and all that but their financial problems never weren't solved by that because people demanded it to be free and all the internet uh, other things um, that provide free advertising you know they they sort of hijack the newspapers advertising but the thing is for, and for free people can read it but they, they're selling advertising as well things like Google AdSense and all that uh, which we've tried but that in itself on a Bible study website makes it worse because pe when people see the ads they think well you don't have to make a donation when the ads don't really pay much you know it takes a lot you need a massive really massive uh, amount of traffic uh, far more than we got although daily bible study is actually one of the largest uh, websites on the internet certainly one of the one of the largest bible study certainly in the top five i would think i don't know i have never looked it up because i don't really care but it's something that you know we have to be able to deal with and if we don't we won't be here it's as plain as day that's that's the reality that comes down to time so if you got any ideas about how to stretch 24 hours into 48 uh, without killing myself, I'd be glad to, to hear it. But until then, here we are. Beginning today then, this is sermon number 701 overall, sermon 260, and our ongoing complete reading of the Holy Bible, the King James Translation. We're beginning at John 18. John chapter 18, keeping in mind that as it was originally written, there was no chapter 18 because there were no chapters in the as it was written. Back then, I think I mentioned a few times that when someone was handed a scroll, you know, they knew their scriptures in order to be able to find things. When they handled, handed the scroll to the Messiah that day as he read in the, in the synagogue, uh, he found what he was looking for himself. And consider if, if you were just handed a Bible in which there were no chapters and verses. Could you find your favorite verse? Well, you would know more or less within which section of it that it would be found in, but could you find it quickly? And, it, you know, it's a different thing. And ironically, again, the reason chapters and verses were put in uh, was, apart from Bible study, for the most part, at least chapters were. It was a printer's convention, and I don't mean a printer's gathering. John 18. When Jesus had spoken these words, he went forth with his disciples over the brook Kidron, where was a garden into which he entered, and his disciples. Now, where you would finish there is it's referring to their observance of the so-called Last Supper. This was the beginning of Nisan 14, because... Days began and ended at sunset. Verse 2, And Judas also, which betrayed him, knew the place, for Jesus oft times resorted thither with his disciples. And the, the garden there is on top of the Mount of Olives, which is just a short, uh, relatively short walk across the Kidron Valley, which sometimes has water in it. Uh, it's where he's going to return. Uh, his feet will stand that day on the Mount of Olives. Uh, there will be a great earthquake on that day in which the Mount of Olives will split. Uh, water will gush forth from that. That's part of the of the prophecy. But there will also, also be spiritual waters. With the link on for those studies. Judas then, having received a band of men and officers from the chief priests and Pharisees, cometh thither with lanterns and torches and weapons, and again, to emphasize there, as we'll read here, with Malchus, the cutting of the ear uh, by Peter. Uh, Malchus is usually portrayed as some poor little errand boy and big, bad, mean bully. Peter uh, whacked him with a sword. Uh, but the fact is, these were the temple guards. Uh, they were, the, in effect, a temple police force, although they weren't really police because they were merely upholding... Uh, the high priest's ego more than anything. I mean, look at me, I must be so important because I need bodyguards, uh, sort of a thing. You know, the most important human that ever ever lived never had any bodyguards. He was just there. He certainly won't need him when he comes back either. Uh, but they were not simply uh, errand boys sent out to, to do. They were big, they were tough, they were armed. 
And when Peter, as we'll read, uh, stepped in front of the Messiah that night to defend the king, which was the right thing to do, um, he was getting himself into a fight with a whole bunch of big old boys. That shows Peter's courage. But again, you know, Peter, his courage, which was not courage when he went beyond it, when it became just a, a bravado sort of a thing. I just did a study about that yesterday. How cocky Peter, you know, he became a chicken. And the Lord used a chicken or a rooster to, to make that point. You know, he went on. As we'll get to again, uh, Peter's denial is a very big part, uh, a, a well-known part of the Bible, but at the same time there was John standing there. Everybody knew who John was, as we'll get to, and he didn't deny him. And that, that is something that's just totally overlooked. I've never heard a preacher emphasize that point or bring it up, ever. And yet it's their plainest days we'll read. Verse 4, Jesus, therefore, knowing all the th all things that should come upon him, went forth and said unto them, Whom seek ye? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus saith unto them, I am he. And Judas also, which betrayed him, stood with them. As soon then as he had said unto them, I am he, they went backward and fell to the ground. Now just think about that. Why, did, why was that? Well, they were a cowardly bunch of jackals, and here was the man that they were hunting, suddenly standing there right in front of them saying, I'm right here. It just showed they backed up. It showed the depth of their courage. They needed a mob for their courage, and even then they had to trip over each other to back up. The front row tripped over the back row, or the next row back, uh, in order to get out of the presence of the man that they were hunting for. And Judas uh, Iscariot, well, he's not even worth me. Judas, again, as I've mentioned many times, and I don't pass up an opportunity to do so, Judas was not, it's become an epithet for a traitor, but he was, Judas Iscariot was the traitor. There were many, many, many men named Judas, uh, including the Lord's own brother, uh, a Bible, a, a book in the Bible, Jude is another form of Judas. It was a name of the, the patriarch, Judah. And the, it, was, it wasn't a bad name, but it's, it's come to be used that way in a particular way. But it, there were a lot of very good righteous men named Judas. Then asked he them again, Whom seek ye? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Was he looking down on the ground? There they were wallowing on the ground. It's like, what you doing down there, boys? You know, you come to hunt me, here I am. Jesus answered, I have told you that I am he. If therefore ye seek me, let these go their way. That the saying might be fulfilled, which he spake, Of them which thou gavest me, have I lost none. Then Simon Peter, having a sword, drew it, and smote the high priest's servant, and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Melchus, and servant there, as referring to a temple, one of the temple guards. He was not just some... A uh, water boy, or you know, something like that. He's been as he's been por portrayed. If anything, he was likely the biggest one. He was at the front of the line because Peter uh, couldn't have hit him if he'd have been standing behind somebody else. Verse eleven. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath, for the cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? Then the band and the captain and officers of the Jews took Jesus and bound him, and led him away to Annas first, for he was the father-in-law to Caiaphas, which was the high priest that same year. A lot of confusion there, the high priest, who it was, but that explains that it was sort of a carryover um, sort of a thing, all in the family sort of a thing, which was biblical in the sense from father to son for the Levitical uh, situation. Son-in-law, well, but again, Verse 14, Now Caiaphas was he which gave counsel to the Jews that it was expedient that one man should die for the people. And he didn't even, I mean, the irony of what he was saying there, uh, yes, it was expedient uh, that he died because humanity is doomed otherwise there was no Savior. But he was just sort of taking Jesus and throwing him under the bus for the sake of, of everybody else because there had just been an a, an insurrection. The Romans were not very pleased with their with their captives, the nation, and the people of 
the regime in, at the temple, the corrupt regime, uh, they were concerned that the Romans were going to come and take the whole little, their whole little game away. So if they could just find some scapegoat, and the, again, the hell they got that one backwards because the scapegoat or a scapegoat, uh, you could apply to Barabbas if some, as some have, he was the one that was released. But Barabbas uh, was not the the slobbering, wild-eyed, uh, crazy man that. For example, Mel Gibson made him out to be. I think he was, he was, if anything, had more noble character and was more patriotic than the people that that he was there ever since that time have, have looked down upon him. Because again, the robber and insurgent that was it was a derogatory term. It meant it meant robber, but it was used as insurgent. They were coming to take away uh, something that uh, had been taken away from from the people of Judah by the invaders. Verse 15, And Simon Peter followed Jesus, and so did another disciple. That disciple was known unto the high priest, and went in with Jesus into the palace of the high priest. And that's referring to John. John was known, and as I said, we'll get to this, how Peter, the denial is about to happen. But everybody already knew who John was. He was allowed in. The high priest knew who he was, what he was about, and let him in. And John, you know, considered the frenzy that was about to happen and was already happening along with the time of insurgency. It was a time of, of disruption of their quiet little situation there. And plus Passover was about to happen, and not everyone was up for that. So, But John, you know, he went in there boldly, and without he, no one had to ask John, you know, are you one of his disciples? Because everybody knew it. Even the high priest knew it, as we just read. But notice verse 16, But Peter stood at the door without, then went out that other disciple, which who, which was known under the high priest, and spake unto her that kept the door, and brought in Peter. So that's how Peter got in to, to do the denial. John, who was already known, uh, was the one that got him in. Then saith the damsel that kept the door unto Peter, Art not thou also one of this man's disciples? He said, I am not. Notice there, she said, also. They already knew John was. But they asked Peter, Are you also one of his disciples? And there was John standing right there. He was the also part of that statement. And Peter said, Oh no, no. Verse 18, And the servants and the officers stood there, who had made a fire of coals, where it was cold, and they warmed themselves. And Peter stood with them and warmed himself. The high priest then asked Jesus of his disciples and of his doctrine. Jesus answered him, I spake openly to the world. I ever taught in the synagogue and in the temple whither the Jews always resort, and in secret have I said nothing. And again, keeping in mind Jesus was a Jew, it's referring to Judaism in those verses. Anytime you see anything that's contrary to the Messiah, it's referring to Judaism, not Jews, because Jews, they were all Jews. Verse 21, Why askest thou me? Ask them which heard me what I have said unto them. Behold, they know what I said. And the high priest did too. I mean, he knew. They knew. That's the reason they had arranged to have him killed. They knew very well what he was teaching. They didn't want to just have him fall down the stairs. They wanted to kill him. Verse 22, And when he had thus spoken, one of the officers which stood by struck Jesus with the palm of his hand, saying, Answerest thou the high priest so? Jesus answered him, If I have spoken evil, bear witness of the evil, but if well, why smitest thou me? Now Annas had sent him bound into Caiaphas the high priest. Now notice he was bound there. I wonder if he would have smacked him, or if any of them would have if he wasn't bound and outnumbered. Because they'd already demonstrated what a bunch of cowardly jackals they were, when he stood before them with both arms free, saying, I am he. And they were fell backwards, stepped backwards in such a fright that they were actually tripping over each other, falling over each other as they were backing up. And yet they were the ones with the weapons and the numbers. He just stood there with the truth, saying, I am he. What of it? Verse 25, And Simon Peter stood and warmed himself. They said, Therefore unto him, Art not thou? Also, one of his disciples, 
He denied it and said, I am not. And there again, they, they didn't bug John, though, did they? They seem to go after the weak ones. And isn't it interesting, you know, we can look forward to prophecy of the end time, the, the Laodicean lukewarm church. Who's going to get the persecution? Is it going to be the, the people who stand for the truth? Well, apparently not, because the devil's a coward. His spirit is cowardly. The jackals that went after those that were there, uh, you know, they went after Peter in this particular case, so they left John alone. John was standing right there, too. But John, they'd already know about John. You know, and John, you know, he didn't say, well, they know who I am, so we better stay, stay out of there where they've taken Jesus. No, he, he went boldly up to the door, banged on the door, and said, let me in. And they let him in. Verse 26, one of the servants of the high priest, being his kinsman, whose, Peter, whose ear Peter cut off, saith, Did not I see thee in the garden with him? Peter then denied again, and immediately the cock crew. And again, you know, it's, it's sad, but Peter was not a coward. I emphasize that point. He was just at that point very mixed up. He wasn't saying in as much, I don't know him, as as much as I don't know what in the world he's doing. Why he said surrender. Verse 28, Then led they Jesus from Caiaphas into the hall of judgment, and it was early, and they themselves went not into the judgment hall, lest they should be defiled, that they might eat the Passover. And again, for the people who argue about Nisan 14, Nisan 15, this is Nisan 14, the Messiah was held overnight of Nisan 14, days begin at sunset. He was crucified at the time the Passover lambs uh, were being sacrificed. That was according to the law of the most ancient times. Passover began at that further sunset, the high day Passover, which was the day one of the Messiah being in the tomb. It says here very plainly the high priest didn't want to dirty his hands with the murder that he was bringing about. I mean, the hypocrisy of, the, of those men. Verse 29, Pilate then went out unto them and said, What accusation bring ye against this man? They answered and said unto him, If he were not a malefactor, we would not have delivered him up unto thee. Then said Pilate unto them, Take ye him and judge him according to your law. The Jews therefore said unto him, It is not lawful for us to put any man to death. And yet, there were a number of instances, at least two, where they were going to stone him. That's murder. That's execution. Uh, the woman caught in adultery. They were going to stone her. Uh, the stoning of Stephen, they sure weren't bothered about that later on, uh, publicly for the Romans to see. Uh, they were just cowardly jackals. They just would never own up to the truth. Just never. They'd, they'd make good politicians today. Big mouth and a lot of lies to spew them with that the saying of Jesus might be fulfilled, which he spake, signifying what death he should die. And which is an important point as well, because if he would have been executed by the Jews, he would have been stoned. And again, the stoning, uh, the part of that that many people don't realize is Jesus was the Lord God of the so-called Old Testament, and stoning was his command. How blasphemers and people like that were to be stoned. Uh, he would not have been executed on the stake. Then Pilate entered into the judgment hall again and called Jesus and said unto him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And again, th calling that the judgment hall, which they did, but you know, it was an absolute tra travesty of justice. Everybody knew he was innocent. Pilate declared him publicly, publicly declared him innocent. The people who set him up knew he was innocent. And a lot of the people... The regular people also knew it because they heard him speak. They knew what he was talking about. They knew they heard him. At the rear, if they, even if they didn't understand, they at least knew what he was actually about, that the charges against him were false. Verse 34, Jesus answered him, Sayest thou this thing of thyself, or did others tell it thee of me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Thine own nation and the chief priests have delivered thee into me. What hast thou done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then would I, my servants fight, that I should not be delivered to the Jews. But now is my kingdom not from hence. 
Pilate therefore said unto him, Art thou a king then? Jesus answered, Thou sayest that I am a king. To this end was I born, and for this cause came I into the world, that I should bear witness unto the truth. Every one that is of the truth heareth my voice. And amen, yes, 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 yes. Absolutely. I know how we know that one. Verse 38, Pilate saith unto him, What is truth? Uh, one of the most famous or perhaps infamous sarcastic comments. What is truth? You know, I mean, you know, back then, I guess, Pilate just had his belly full of fake news as well. Fortunately, the, those who make the accusation are themselves the biggest proponents or creators of false fake news, but whatever. That's all going to come up one day. And when he had said this, he went out again unto the Jews, and saith unto them, I find in him no fault at all. But ye have a custom that I should release unto you one at the Passover. Will ye therefore that I release unto you the king of the Jews? Then cried they all again, saying, Not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. And that was the term that was used, but he was an actually an insurgent. And they were executing three insurgents. The other two, called thieves, they most likely were as well. The, the terminology, the, the placement of the three of them together, almost certainly. Barabbas, whether he, he was, in fact, a zealot, whether he was one or not, he did what the zealots later on did in greater numbers. He was a man who was willing to stand up and fight for his country, to run the Romans out of there. And he probably understood the fact that if you are an insurgency, if you if some superpower has invaded your country, you have to do things that magnify each man's destructiveness. And that's done through their heads. Just killing them, well, that's nice, but you know, you're gonna lose your own people. There's if they're outnumbering you, you've got to do better than that. And apparently what Barabbas did was something very nasty. Uh, to the beyond the point of merely killing an enemy soldier, he did something that was going to have a psychological effect on the remainders. And that was beyond uh, normal military law. He, he was probably guilty in that sense, but the reason he did it was not. I mean, if you're invaded by, by anybody, by, by a superpower, you're going to do what you're going to do. That has happened throughout history over and over and over again. People who are outnumbered, by virtue of the fact that they are outnumbered, have to be more effective in what they do. And Barabbas, I think a lot of people are going to be surprised that he was he's not the madman or the psychotic uh, that he's been made out to be. He was a little bit extreme, but you don't know what could have happened to him. You don't know his family history. Uh, members of his family could have been killed. Um, whatever set him off, uh, sometimes courage, it's simply a matter of vengeance. Um, someone who's, who's very angry, who's seeking revenge, could be the greatest coward to begin with, but they get over that. Uh, and I'm not saying he was a coward either, but he was he was not what they made him out to be. And the fact that they wanted him turned loose, I mean, even then, you know, at least Jesus was peaceful. But if he was truly the violent psychotic that he's been made out to be, you know, they were demanding that he be released among their own people. That doesn't make sense either. I think they had more respect, even though they didn't have the backbone to admit it. Uh, they did have, a, and we don't know what happened to him. He could have ended up with the zealots. The time frame is a little, he would have been very old by then, but I don't think it would have made a much difference to him. If he could still walk and swing a sword, or if he could still think, I think he would have been there, because he already had been. And, this is where it began for him. We'll see one day, but I think the world has got a big surprise coming when it comes to Barabbas. And maybe those other two thieves as well, because they weren't thieves, they were insurgents. John 19, keeping in mind there were no chapters. Then Pilate therefore took Jesus and scourged him. Now you can see there, there's no break in time, there was no break in what was happening. It was simply an arbitrary division written by someone who probably didn't even believe in the Bible. How the chapters were there as a convenience, as a condition of how books were becoming printed at the time. It made sense. To print. Perhaps they wanted to do an index. Perhaps, you know, whatever. But it was not there 
for the purpose of the reason it was originally recorded. Uh, John would, could look at this, or any of the writers of each of the books, the scrolls, could look at what they've written and say, what are these divisions in here? What are these little numbers in here? They wouldn't have a clue, because they never put them there. Then there, Pilate therefore took Jesus and scorched him, and the soldiers plaited a crown of thorns, and put it on his head, and they put on him a purple robe and said, Hail, King of the Jews, and they smote him with their hands. Pilate therefore went forth again and said unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you, that ye may know that I find no fault in him. Now, what was he doing? Was Pilate sort of trying to shock them into letting the man go? Trying to get them to say, Enough, we know he's innocent. Uh, don't beat him, don't bloody him, don't commit the war crime on him that you're doing anymore? Is that what he was trying? It sounds sort of like that. There is, we don't know what happened to Pilate. Uh, there have been a number of fanciful stories. Some believe that he became a Christian. Uh, we know his wife was, at least at this time, and that he may uh, have committed suicide, that finally he just couldn't bear doing what he had done any longer, so he committed suicide. Well, that doesn't make sense for the, in, the, in the true Christian sense, because... If he had become a true Christian, he would have realized that he would be forgiven if he repented, and therefore, for the rest of his life thereafter, whatever time he had, uh, effective time, uh, because you can live a long time but not be able to do anything for a lot of those last years. It's, it's functional time that really matters. To live his life overcoming, learning the scriptures, uh, doing good things, uh, and all of that, you don't just sort of like Judas did, uh, you know, hang himself and, and be gone with it. Because that's it, it, it it not a solution. It's not an escape because at the moment he went unconscious, uh, he's going to be awake again from his conscious perspective and he's going to have that problem it's still there. And, you know, what the judgment of again, it, it's easy to judge Judas uh, for what he did, but at the same time, we don't have to. And the Lord is going to judge him. And the Lord knew him better than anybody, as far as that is concerned. He was chosen for the reason that he was. Uh, when someone says, when the Lord says about someone, uh, it would have been better if he weren't born, that, that tends to indicate that Judas isn't going to repent. But we'll see. We have our own problems to deal with, our own getting there to deal with, and we'll know. By the way, the hanging thing there that he did, there's a thing now for the countries that still have executions. Uh, here in Canada, we don't have the death penalty anymore. It was abolished. Before that, we had hanging. But other countries have various means of execution. Uh, there's a thing now in the U.S., the states that execute uh, people. The, the drugs that they've been using for executions, the companies refuse to, or some of them are refusing to sell it. Uh, and, and so in the man, even then, it's like, it goes on, even when it's done right, it lasts like a half an hour or something. Hanging, you know, is probably one of the easiest and most humane means of execution that there is. And I'm not talking about drop hanging, I'm talking about suspension hanging. I don't want to get into detail of this, because it you don't hang hang. When suspension hanging, they go unconscious in about 15 seconds from the cut off the blood flow and they strangle while they're unconscious. They don't know. It's really one of the most humane. We see the thing in, in Iran. Iran's one of the boogeymen at this present time, where they'll execute people uh, from a crane. They don't do the drop hanging. They do the suspension hanging. And actually, it's one of the most humane things that there is. The placement of the rope is different. Uh, for you know, Without getting in the details or get, giving people ideas, the drop hanging that was done uh, to... Saddam was saying the rope is at the side of the neck, the knot, so when it causes that snap uh, from a certain height, and the height is calculated, you can't have it too long. But whereas suspension hanging, the knot is at the back because it's there to cut off the carotid arteries on each side, the cutting off of the blood flow. There used to be a wrestler that did the sleeper thing. It was fake wrestling, but apparently the sleeper was real, and you could actually kill people with it. And actually, I think some police holds, did they not teach that as a, somehow someone died uh, from that while being arrested or something? Uh, it was just held too long because it's so effective. But as far as, I, if you're going to have the death penalty, to me, suspension, hanging is, is 
no chemicals required is the rope and you know as far as humaneness they're, they're from their conscious perspective they're they're unconscious in about 15 seconds they don't know the strangulation there's no pain nothing and you know that's that's pretty humane i think but again the world such as it is um wants to do things the hard way but on, tragically i i think the only thing tragic about judas's suicide was he took the easy way out painless death considering what he had just caused to happen to the messiah which was hardly a painless death it was a horrendously painful and gory mess and again uh, how the, the we see these fake crucifixes uh, with a man without a mark on him a pretty boy without a mark on him when the real messiah on the cross uh, was beaten literally to a pulp he was beaten literally unrecognizable uh, and again the reality of it the people will know that as well including the people who beat him are one day going to face him for that verse 5 then came jesus forth wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe and pilate saith unto them behold the man when the chief priests therefore and officers saw him they cried out, saying, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate, Pilate saith unto them, Take ye him and crucify him, for I find no fault in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and by our law he ought to die, because he made himself the Son of God. Then, when Pilate therefore heard that, saying, He was the more afraid, and went again into the judgment hall, and saith unto Jesus, Whence thou art? But Jesus gave him no answer. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me? Knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me, except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivereth me unto thee hath greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, saying, If thou let this man go, or art not Caesar's friend, whosoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. And they threw in, this is a direct tie, and again, I've, I've never heard a preacher mention this, make the connection. There had just been an uprising, an insurgency. Barabbas, again, was the leader of the or at least a prominent member of it. The other two men who were going to be executed were insurgents, not just cheap thieves, everyday thieves. It was That was also a matter that was a part of the frenzy at that particular time. And again, when those things get going, people's patriotism gets into it. Uh, unless you do what we think is right, you're not patriotic. And they were throwing this one directly to Pilate. And Pilate, you know, there he was, he was actually in there pitching to get Jesus released. The beating even was, was intended to get him released. Uh, you know, it was a as we said, now look what we've done to him, isn't that enough? But there, the politics now is self-preservation, and they knew how to manipulate people and how to manipulate the, the patriotism thing. Uh, it becomes like a mind control label, uh, and it worked again. I mean, it had to. Pilate was, was trying to do the right thing, but when it comes down to his own his own salvation, if you will, saving his own self from, from those kinds of accusations might not have got him killed but would have put a mark onto his onto his record or at least in his view uh, of, of of Caesar in, in Rome which at this this time was Tiberius uh, that was that was the killer right there verse 13 when Pilate therefore heard that saying he brought Jesus forth and sat down in the judgment seat in a place that is called the pavement but in Hebrew Gabbatha and it was the preparation of the Passover and about the sixth hour. And he saith unto the Jews, Behold your king. Now, two important points. Preparation of the Passover. Again, in Psalm 14, wasn't the high day. People will argue about that anyway. They say it's the 15th or the 14th. Or when should we observe it and all the things. Well, my suggestion would be to read the Bible and do what it says. Because there is no... There is no controversy if you simply do what's written. I mean, it's plain as day with the high priest. He wanted to get it done so he could observe the Passover at that sunset. It's the preparation day as it's stated here. And about the sixth hour, which means from the time, the sundial time 
Uh, it was noon, high noon. Verse 15, But they cried out, Away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate saith unto them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, We have no king but Caesar. And hand me the air sickness bag, please. The most traitorous thing, you know, there they were under Roman occupation. We have no, we have no king but the foreign man who rules over us in our own country. That's, that's the state of mind that they had. And, you know, it's the brainwashing that was done on them was an ancient thing, but it's, there's a modern version of it today, how people will become brainwashed by an imperial power. It isn't just a matter of, of military boots on the ground in a country. It's what people, they is done on their heads before they get there. And sometimes it was done really good, and sometimes it is. Uh, a military invasion isn't even necessary. In that sense, the Hollywood quote-unquote uh, is just as much a propaganda machine to control people as anything. And this was he was full of Hollywood at that time. I'm talking about the principle, not the place. Verse 16, Then deliver he, him therefore unto them to be crucified. And they took Jesus and led them away. And you see why our donations dropped. I'm going to speak truth a little more blunt about it. But again, we'll just have to worry about that, won't we? If you want, uh, you know, lies and garbage, then you, there's all kinds of places you can go. But this is never going to be one of them, even if we have to. We made the reference to the temple. Uh, twice the Lord had his own temple torn down because people abused it and turned their backs on it. That actually, that the symbolism of that was, we had a little talk about that a few days ago. Verse 17, And he bearing his cross went forth into a place called the place of a skull which is called in the Hebrew Golgotha, where they crucified him and two other with him on either side and Jesus in the midst. And there he was hanging on Barabbas' cross. Barabbas was loose. And no doubt, you know, think what was going on through Barabbas' mind because there he would have been able, because he was free to go wherever he wanted, do whatever he wanted. And you think he wasn't there looking across, seeing what, no pun intended, looking across to see what his cross, uh, how he would have died. And perhaps he, he knew, perhaps the two that were hanging there, one on each side of Jesus, were uh, his, his lieutenants. Because, you know, that's the way the cross was set. And again, how Parabarabas was a leader, and the other two might have been his compatriots in the very thing that they were arrested together for. Because they didn't hold people very long. As a matter of justice, you know, it's rather swift. And the fact that they were going to be executed together may well mean uh, that they were they were arrested together or captured together, more likely, is the word, because they weren't criminals. I, I don't think so. It doesn't fit. It doesn't fit the words from, from way back then. Verse 19, And Pilate wrote a title and put it on the cross, and the writing was, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. This title then read many of the Jews for the place where Jesus was crucified was now nigh to the city and was written in Hebrew, Greek, and Latin. And an important point as well, people will debate about the stake. Well, there was a stake. It was already in the ground. It was set there. And the cross beam or cross piece, as plainly recorded in the scriptures, was carried uh, to uh, the place of execution. It was as much a restraining device uh, as it was uh, the cross part of the crucifying device. Now, it begs the question, was the cross piece that Jesus wore taken off of Barabbas and put on Jesus? Because it was something was carried from there to there, and the restraining device, it was obviously, the one that was on Barabbas was obviously taken off. So was it placed directly? I mean, we know for a fact that Jesus was crucified on the cross that Barabbas would, would, would have been crucified on. So was he also wearing Barabbas' cross piece? Interesting question. I've never heard a preacher talk about that either. Verse 21, Then said the chief priests of the Jews to Pilate, Write not the king of the Jews, but that he said, I am king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Then the soldiers, when they had crucified Jesus, took his garments and made four parts to every soldier apart and also his coat. Now the coat was without seam, woven from the top throughout. They said, therefore, among themselves, let us not rend it, but cast lots for it, 
whose it shall be that the scripture might be fulfilled, which saith, They parted my raiment among them, and for my vesture they did cast lots. Now that would be like a, a cover or a, a sweater, uh, which, has, which is no opening at the front. You pull it on over your head. These things, therefore, the soldiers did. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister. Stop. Is that, is that really just really, really plain? His mother's sister? Is that plain? Mary, the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus, therefore, saw his mother and the disciples standing by whom he loved, he said unto his mother, Woman, behold thy son. Then said he to the disciple, Behold thy mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her into his own home. And again, John. That's how we know from the earlier incident that was talking about John. John was standing there with his Aunt Mary and his own mother. And when Jesus said to go to Mary to go and live with John, it was a matter of going to live with her nephew John and her sister. And we'll get we'll put the link on for the name of her, which is Salome. Again stated in the Bible, plain as day. You don't hear many preachers say to speak about that anyway, either. I guess we're sort of unique, aren't we? Verse 28, After this, Jesus, knowing that all things were now accomplished, that the scripture might be fulfilled, said, I thirst. Now there was set a vessel full of vinegar, and they filled a sponge with vinegar, and put it upon hyssop, and put it to his mouth. When Jesus, therefore, had received the vinegar, he said, It is finished. And he bowed his head, and gave up the ghost. And again, we'll put the link on that study. It's the dying breath, and how that physical breath that all humans have, there's actually a lot written about that in the Bible, how originally inanimate matter was made living matter by the breath of the Holy Spirit, which was made uh, a physical breath, and the two are together. The physical breath is not spiritual, but when you give up that life breath, uh, as it's the reason as well why it's stated plainly that if the Lord were to withdraw his spirit, all breathing things would die, how it would be converted back to that. But this is not a spiritual giving up the ghost, as in a ghost is simply a dying breath, the life force of the breath. Verse 31, the Jews therefore, because it was the preparation that upon the body should remain upon the cross on the Sabbath day, for that Sabbath was an high day, besought Pilate that their legs might be broken and they might be taken away. And again, the classic mistake, uh, preparation, Sabbath coming up, so they assumed it was Friday, but it doesn't say the regular weekly Sabbath. It said the high day, and it said that, and prior to that time it said Passover, in preparation for the Passover. It was a regular weekly Sabbath later on, three days and three nights later, when which the resurrection occurred. Put the link on for that study. This was not the, a Friday. You can't get Friday uh, into the same day twice in the same week. There were two Sabbaths that week. The high day Passover Sabbath and the regular weekly Sabbath. There were two preparation days, therefore, that week. One for Passover, in which the Messiah was crucified, as we just read, and as they just called it Preparation Day. And then the later Sabbath that, as we'll read, they rested and brought the things to the tomb early the next morning, uh, but the tomb was already empty because the resurrection had occurred exactly as decided, declared, uh, three days and three nights later. He was put in the tomb just before sunset on Nissan 15 on a Wednesday and then was Christ- resurrected just minutes before sunset on the seventh day Sabbath. They didn't know it because they were at home, as it's also plainly stated, they stayed at home during that Sabbath. Then came the soldiers and break the legs of the first and of the other which was crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. Now put the link on for that study. But one of the soldiers with a spear pierced his side and, and forthwith came up blood and water. And he that saw it bear record, and his record is true, and he knoweth that he said was true, that ye might believe. Again, John. For these things were done that the scripture might be fulfilled. A bone of him shall not be broken. 
And another scripture saith, They shall look on him whom they pierced. And after this, Joseph of Arimathea, being a disciple of Jesus, but secretly for fear of the Jews, besought Pilate that he might take away the body of Jesus. And Pilate gave him leave, and he, might, and he came therefore and took the body of Jesus. And there came also Nicodemus, which at the first came by to Jesus by night, and brought a mixture of myrrh and aloes, about an hundred pound weight. And they took the body of Jesus and wound it in linen clothes with the spices as the manner of the Jews is to bury. Now in the place where he was crucified there was a garden, and in the garden a new sepulchre wherein was never man yet laid, there laid they Jesus, therefore, because the, of the Jews' preparation day, for the sepulchre was at hand. Now, normally I would have stopped right there because we're also out of time. Um, but just to keep the point going here, I will continue for the first few verses of chapter 20. The first day of the week came with Mary Magdalene early when it was yet dark under the sepulchre, and seeth the stone taken away from the sepulchre. Then she runneth and cometh to Simon Peter, and to the other disciple, whom Jesus loved, and 